Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. In this week's lecture, we're covering astigmatism and what it should mean to you as an optician. Hey, Sean Lassard here from modernoptician.com where we help student opticians achieve their goals through books, study guides, and online video just like this one. So once again, if you've seen value in this video, make sure to smash the like button, subscribe, and turn on all notifications so you don't miss a single video as they drop every week. Now let's jump into this presentation about astigmatism. And welcome to the lecture on astigmatism. So over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about normal vision, we've talked about myopia, and we've talked about hyperopia. And we've talked about all the different links between anatomy and optics that kind of get behind the mechanism of how these refractive errors work, how they manifest themselves, and basically what you should know as an optician. So we continue that trend today with astigmatism and another one where a lot of students kind of struggle with, they get the basics, however, they tend to struggle with the minor details that really allow you to fully understand what's going on and to make better recommendations and fit it better. So without further ado, let's jump into it and see exactly what we need to know about astigmatism. And in every single one of these lectures, I always make sure to mention that you can get more help in your studies, whether you're preparing for your board exams or just trying to be a better dispenser make sure to check out modernoptician.com. We have loads of books and study guides, and this particular lecture follows very closely to workbook one of the study guides for apprentice opticians. There's entire pages on refractive error and specifically astigmatism. You can review, you can test your knowledge, and you could just basically learn a whole lot more. So again, make sure to check out modernoptician.com. The link to the study guide and the books are will be in the description below. And now we can get into this presentation about astigmatism. Okay, so you're probably pretty used to this now if you've been following along in the last couple of lectures. We're gonna go over astigmatism simplified so that we can kind of take a look at what the general consensus is in education land as far as when you're learning about astigmatism, what the textbooks are showing you, what the simplified versions are, and uh, then of course we're going to dig a little bit deeper as to what you should really know if you want to be a modern optician, if you want to be really good at your craft. So bring up an image like this. Astigmatism usually is kind of you know characterized as blurred vision um, and a lot of the times you hear a lot of uh, description of distance vision. You see here in the image here that we have normal vision where all the headlights look okay. And then we have all these starbursts and flare coming off the lights. So this is kind of like that characteristic symptom of astigmatism, not being able to see uh, you know, lights at night clearly. Then another common analogy or example is in fonts or print. Sometimes things get skewed. So, you know, these are these are the common symptoms that you'll hear patients describe when they're describing their astigmatism. And it's also something that the textbooks often describe as well. Now, one concept that I wanted to go over is the other thing that you're gonna see repeated over and over again is that the, uh, the eye is shaped like a football. Oh boy, I hate this one. And it's something that my students know very well. It's kind of blasphemy in, uh, in our training to ever say that. I cannot stand this analogy. First of all, it's not the eye that's misshapen at all. It's the cornea and sometimes the crystalline lens. Therefore, that concept is completely incorrect. And for that reason, I'm going to implore you to never ever use this eye shaped like a football. And if it's it's not even, it doesn't even help because the patients go around thinking that their eyes are shaped like a football. They think they have some kind of issue. And it's not even, you know, I understand sometimes when we use kind of layman analogies to describe things to patients to try to help them through, but this isn't even accurate. And uh, it's just, just no good. And the reality is if you did dig a little bit deeper and the textbooks will sometimes use the football analogy, but in reality, it's that the surface of the cornea or lens is unequally curved. Okay, so yes, a football is unequally curved, but it doesn't resemble a football necessarily. And the other thing too, is that it's not the eye, it's the cornea and sometimes the crystalline lens. So this is the simplified version. And if you 
are stuck on this football analogy, I definitely encourage you to kind of focus more on this analogy where there's two different planes or two different meridians of curvature on the cornea. You'll see here in the red that there's this one curvature and in the green there's this other curvature here. Now this is accurate and this is something that you're going to want to carry along with you in your description of astigmatism, but now we're going to dig a little bit deeper into what all this stuff really means. All right, so now that we know a little bit about astigmatism as far as having different curvatures on the cornea or the lens, and we have an idea of what the overall kind of symptoms are, let's take a look a little bit deeper as far as what the mechanism is and exactly where all this stuff is coming from. So if we look at a bit of a kind of a schematic here of what normal vision looks like, we see here that a spherical cornea, in this case here, when the parallel rays of light come in, the plane, the vertical, and the horizontal plane are equally refracted through the cornea so that they can actually come to a single point focus. Now, recall when we looked at normal vision, when we looked at myopia and we looked at hyperopia, we were always dealing with this kind of idea where everything came to a single point of focus. In normal vision, it landed right on the retina. In, in myopia, it landed in, in front. Uh, and in hyperopia, it landed behind. However, we were never dealing with multiple po uh, point foci. We were dealing with one single point, point focus. However, in the case of astigmatism, this misshapen cornea where there's two different curvatures of power, one in the vertical meridian and one in the horizontal meridian, when light is refracted by this refractive um, medium, all of a sudden the refraction in the horizontal plane is different than in the vertical plane. So you'll see here the green whoops, sorry, the green area here is where the refraction is taking place through the horizontal plane, and the red one is where it's taking place in the vertical plane. So we're getting two completely different point focus from the same refractive object, and this is where all of these uh, visual symptoms are, st not all of them, but this is where some of the visual symptoms are stemming from. And of course, we know as opticians that the solution to this is to correct it with a toric lens. So if there are two different meridians of curvature on the cornea, well, the toric lens will actually match those different radii of curvature so that when the light is being is passing through it, it's accounting for the fact that there's different refractive powers depending on the location of the cornea. Now, if we look at the eyes on a straight on kind of schematic here, as opposed to a cross section, the way this is represented is that the cornea in the spherical, so this would be a spherical cornea, the the, the meridians of curvature would be equal. So you see here that we've outlined that the vertical meridian has a curvature of 42 diopters and the horizontal meridian has a curvature of 42 diopters as well. So this would actually you know, dic dictate that the you get a single point focus just like in this example on this side. However, what goes on in a astigmatic cornea? In this particular case, you see here that the horizontal meridian has a 42 diopter curvature, whereas the vertical meridian has a 44 diopter curvature. Now, this would actually characterize a two diopter cylinder. Right? So we correlate astigmatism with cylinder in the prescription. The difference between these two meridians is two diopters, 42 and 40, and that is your astigmatic error, a, a two diopter difference, and we usually characterize this as being the cylinder power. And of course, if you were to correct it with a lens, this is how this would be, assuming that the um, 42 diopters here it would be sufficient to converge light onto the retina and there's no refractive error present in that meridian that other meridian would be corrected with the with with my my apologies with a two diopter lens and you'll notice here and we're going to get a little bit deeper into this in the next slides however the reason i know that there's a minus two diopter um correction here is that i'm assuming the normal eye schematics like gullstrand's eye or the schematic eye a 44 diopter uh, curvature would likely translate somewhere it's steeper so it would create more converging power which is very indicative of myopia anyways we're not going to get too deep into this we're going to go a little bit deeper in the, few, in the other slides as far as how astigmatism represents itself in combination with myopia and hyperopia but for the time being just remember that 
the astigmatism is stemming from the difference in curvature between the two meridians of the eye, or the two meridians of the cornea in this particular case. So this is where we get into the important part where a lot of students kind of miss this, and a lot of, quite honestly, a lot of opticians kind of miss this aspect of it as well. So we've written here that not all astigmatism is created equal. So it's important to realize that astigmatism is the condition and not necessarily the refractive error. Astigmatism is the fact that the cornea or crystalline lens, and for the most part from moving forward from this slide, we're just gonna assume it's the cornea, that the difference in curvature between the two meridians is there, but it's not necessarily the primary refractive error, it's just a condition within the refractive error. Some myopia and hyperopia, or both at the same time in some cases, will always accompany astigmatism. There's no such thing as having just astigmatism. Now, this is a key, key point to understand because I hear so many students and opticians refer to this as just, oh, you just have astigmatism. Astigmatism, other than having the difference in refractive meridians, does not necessarily carry with it specific symptoms the way myopia and hyperopia do and the reality is is that difference will always either equal a myopic difference or a hyperopic difference very very important to realize this now in astigmatism there's two separate point point focus uh, which each will either fall on one of each at least will either fall on in front or behind of the retina. And there's a number of different combinations and different ways that this can happen. And every single one of these combinations will have specific symptoms and specific things that you should be thinking of as an optician on how to deal with this. And we're about to go through these. And again, these are things that people don't think of when they're looking at the prescriptions or they're considering the person's astigmatism. And they tend to treat astigmatism with one or paint it with one brush and it's not accurate because every single type of astigmatism here is going to have a different symptom and we're going to show i'm going to show you here a very easy way to understand this and to start thinking a, a little bit outside the box of how what what the perception is with these types of astigmatism so first one we have here and this, these are not organized in any particular order of which one's more common or uncommon just simply these are the different types of astigmatism that can present themselves we have simple myopic where remembering that we have two point focus that that get converged through this refractive surface one will end up in front which we already know that whenever the rays of light converge in front of the retina it is a myopic pattern and the other one will converge onto the retina simple myopic so what does that look like in a prescription well here we are a prescription like this where it's plano minus one at 180 would characterize a simple myopic prescription. This means that the 180 meridian is plano or zero, and then there's a minus one cylinder, there's minus one power here. I want you to get used to looking at everything in form of optical crosses. I know you've probably seen optical crosses in textbooks and most students just glaze over them. They just assume that it's just some kind of weird graphical representation of how this is done in textbooks. But if you start to think of things in the form of optical crosses, you will never get it wrong because I'm gonna go on a bit of a tangent here. However, this prescription, this does not mean a whole lot other than being a notation to describe things. You're gonna see it more in the other examples as we go through these. You can't look at the prescription at face value. You have to think of what these things mean. So in this particular case, plano meaning that one of the meridians is, uh, is, is perfectly suited to converge a light on the retina. We don't need any refractive power, but the other meridian is myopic. So we have a minus one at the other meridian. And then we have simple hyperopic on the kind of opposite end of the spectrum where, again, one of these land on the retina and the other one lands behind the retina, typical of a myopic pattern. And again, what does that look like? Well, here we have a prescription and this is where I'm telling you that optical crosses come in handy because this is something that throws people for a loop. This is an example of a simple hyperopic prescription. So what do we know? The one at the 180 diopter meridian, we have a plus one requirement. A lot of students would just say, oh, there's a minus one at the other, but that's not what this means. This is just a representation 
of what the optical cross essentially is. This means that the other meridian is plano because you combine these two. The cylinder and the sphere power get combined in an optical cross. And on the 90 degree meridian, you have no power. So this is a simple hyperopic prescription, meaning that, yes, one of the rays of light have been converged onto the retina, but the other one's hyperopic. So to compare these two between each other, this person is, is, is uh, this first example is astigmatic and so is the second, but they have completely different experiences. So just because they're astigmatic doesn't necessarily mean that their visual experience will be the same. This person is going to exhibit symptoms of, of, of myopia, whereas this person is going to exhibit, you know, uh, symptoms of hyperopia. Very important to realize. Then we have a compound hyperopic. Uh, astigmatism where both rays end up behind the retina. So once again, let's do an example. In this case, you have plus two minus one. So at the 180 meridian, we have a plus two correction. And at the 90 degree meridian, we have a plus one. If you're not sure what I'm doing here, it's time to review the optical cross situations here because Again, this is just this gets combined with this, and this demonstrates the powers at the different meridians. So once again, keeping with this kind of train of thought, this person here has a very hyperopic experience because both the both of the line foci end up being converged behind the retina. They're fully hyperopic, and in case you're wondering, the visual effects of compound, sorry, compound hyperopia will be a little more significant and simple because in this case, part of the refractive kind of situation is landing on the retina, which, which is good. In this case, both of them are landing behind, which is bad for, for everything. And of course, since we've done compound hyperopic, now we do compound myopic, where both of the focus come in front of the retina. And here's another example. In this case, we have a minus one power at the 180 meridian and a minus two power at the 90 meridian. Again, combining these two, when you add pluses together, sorry, when you add minuses together, they become a bigger minus. So in this case, we have two of the line foci converging in front of the retina. This person is fully myopic and they will have a more negative myopic experience than over here in simple myopia. And finally, in case you've kind of guessed it already, we have mixed where one of them ends up in front and the other one ends up behind. And let's do another example of what that ends up looking like. So we have a plus one here at the 180 meridian. And then if we combine this one, we have a minus one at the 90 degree meridian. So basically what's happening here is that you get a combination of a hyperopic convergence and a myopic convergence in the same eye. And we're going to talk a little bit more in detail in future slides what this looks like. But the take home message here, and I know I've gone long on this slide, but, the t but this is so important in astigmatism. Every single situation is different and every single experience is different. So if you're gonna take anything, realize that just saying, ah, you have astigmatism means very little. As a matter of fact, patients carry this concept of astigmatism like along with them, like it's some kind of, of crazy disease. The reality is, is most, most of the patients you're gonna be fitting with eyeglasses or contact lenses have some form of astigmatism. It's extremely common. And I, I hear patients all the time say, give me their prescription. They say, I have astigmatism when they're like a plus six or a, a hyperope or a minus six hyperope with like a quarter cylinder. They think their astigmatism is significant, which in, in the case, in these cases, I've just kind of outlined, it's so irrelevant that, that it really doesn't even need to be mentioned. So it's important to realize the astigmatism is very dependent on the type of and its relation to the other refractive error, whether it's myopic or hyperopic correction. Okay, so now that I've gone so long on the previous slide, I wanna kind of reel it in here and I want you to understand exactly what total refractive error means. So we've talked about how you gotta stop looking at astigmatism as the main culprit here in, in the visual problem. You have to look at it globally as far as how does it compare to the overall refractive error and how does it contribute to it? Because the, the, the two different meridians that we're talking about will either be hyperopic or myopic and that astigmatism is simply representing the two different sides and how they relate to each other. So let's take a look at one very, very important equation that I think that we should all have in our back pocket. It's an easy one. 
and it's the spherical equivalent equation and it tells you so much about a patient's vision most of the time when you go through the literature spherical equivalent is usually referred to with the lenses with as you know when you're getting into ophthalmic optics and sometimes we talk about spherical equivalent in contact lens fitting however very rarely do we talk about it when we're just fitting eyeglasses and we are just looking at the person's refractive air the reason for that is because we don't fit glasses based on spherical equivalent. We fit torque lenses that fit the exact refractive air, the, the difference in, in, in meridian power through the cylinder. I'm not suggesting here that we're fitting spherical equivalents. What I'm suggesting is that we use spherical equivalent to get a good understanding of what type of refractive air and what the overall power this patient is dealing with. So. Quick review, spherical equivalent is equal to the sphere power plus half the cylinder power. This is one of the easiest equations you'll ever use. So why don't we do a few kind of examples here to see exactly how this kind of relates to our overall kind of train of thought when we're looking at prescriptions. So for example, this patient, the right eye is plano minus 250 at 132, and the left eye is minus one, minus one at 97. So we're gonna break it down, right eye and left eye. So the first thing I'll do here is the right eye. What is the spherical equivalent of this right eye? So again, with the equation, we will take plano, which is zero, plus one half of the cylinder, minus 250. Make sure to carry your signs. So that would be equal to zero plus minus 125. So the grand total here is minus 125. So you see what I'm kind of saying here? If you just looked at this prescription, you said, oh, he's got astigmatism or she's got astigmatism, and that's all you said, well, then you wouldn't necessarily be making the right recommendations and all, and you wouldn't be kind of you know, incorporating all the nuances we talked about a couple lectures ago when we talked about myopia. Now you know that this patient is technically myopic. Yes, they're also they, they're also suffering from astigmatism. However, the overall correction here is myopic. Now, are you going to fit them with a minus 125 lens? No, of course not. You're going to still fit them with a toric lens that matches the prescription. However, you now have an understanding that this patient is overall myopic. So when it comes to understanding that, you know, how their vision is, you know that their distance vision is lousy. You know that their nearest vision is not quite as bad as their distance vision, albeit we're going to talk a little bit more about what happens when you have a gap between the two meridians uh, with astigmatism like this and how it's not necessarily going to be as clear as what a, like a spherical minus 125 is. However, now you have a little bit more context as to what's going on. If we do the same thing to the left eye, now we're looking at minus one, minus one. So we take the sphere power, which is a minus one, and we do plus one half of a minus one. So now this becomes minus one plus minus 0.5. So your spherical equivalent is equal to minus 1.5. I'm going through these equations. When you get good at this, you just look at it and you get it. And you, I'd, you'll be able to tell me right away that that's a minus 150. But once again, you see that if you just looked at this prescription, you said, ah, they're a minus one. And you just assume, you know, you get to a point when you practice optician enough that you kind of have an idea what the, what the visual acuity and the performance and things are going to be for like any particular power for a minus one, for example. However, you have to keep in consideration that the cylinder comes into place so the overall power this person is looking through resembles much more a minus 150 so that gives you a little bit more context on exactly how myopic this patient is on the other side of the equation let's take a look at hyperopic patients here uh, and we've actually kind of incorporated uh, a little bit of the same concept here but you'll see that in this particular case if we have this prescription which is plus 3 minus 250 this looks kind of messy on, on the surface, right? You think, wow, this person is pretty hyperopic um, and they have a high degree of astigmatism. However, if we calculate the right eye's spherical equivalent and we do the same thing, we do plus three and then we do plus one half of a minus 250. And of course, that's gonna be a minus 125. So now all of a sudden, your prescription is gonna be plus three plus minus one. 25 now all of a sudden we end up with a plus 
175, which is much less significant than a plus three, much less hyperopic. And you end up in a situation where maybe, maybe the person's vision and distance is not quite as bad as you would have initially perceived if you were just consider. sorry, the uh, vision up close, my apologies, uh, would not be quite as bad as you would have perceived, or even in distance, I shouldn't say that because we just talked about in hyperopia where the, this is a distance prescription and depending on accommodation, this person might actually have distance issues, um, but it's not as bad as if you were looking at a plus three. And this is why sometimes if you start making these recommendations and assumptions based on the prescription without fully understanding it, sometimes you're going to get surprised where you're going to assume the patient should be seeing really lousy in the distance. And based on this type of thing and the, the overall spherical equivalent you're looking through is actually not as bad as you expected. How about the left eye? Well, it's very similar to the right eye that we had where it's plano in the one meridian. So we have zero plus one half of a minus one. So we'll just skip real quick. We have got a minus 50 spherical equivalent. So again, we have a plano sphere. You might assume, oh, they might not see that bad. The reality is, is that this patient is actually pretty, uh, not pretty, but just a little myopic. So it gives you a little bit more context as to what this person is experiencing overall. Okay, so far, we ha I've been hammering home that it's not about the astigmatism, it's not about the cylinder power, it's all about whether the eye is myopic or hyperopic and how the astigmatism either takes away or adds to the major refractive error of the eye. And I really want that to be the main thing that you focus on when you're looking at astigmatic prescriptions. However, there is something to be said about the impact of the cylinder power based on how much cylinder power there is. Because the bigger the cylinder, meaning the larger the amount of astigmatism, means that there's a larger gap between curvature one and curvature two. And that will have an impact on vision. And that's where, you know, we're talking, and if you remember in the first slide, we talked about the images of the cars with the headlights where, you know, you're getting starbursts and tails off of the lights. That's because the refractive experience out of one meridian is different than the other. And, the eye, the, and along the way, along the visual kind of process, these two images have to be combined somewhere. And depending on where they're combined, they may not be clear. They might be a little bit skewed, even if the hyperopia or myopia was attempted to be corrected with, let's say, the spherical equivalent. So... Let's jump into this and look at a few of the things that we should know about overall cylinder power. So we know that cylinder power represents the difference in power between F1 and F2, meaning the two different curvatures of the cornea. We talked about the horizontal curvature and the vertical curvature. So that would be, let's say, F1 here and F2 here. So we're just basically saying that the difference between these two represents the cylinder power. Now, the larger the cylinder, the larger the negative impact on visual blur. I know, I've repeated over and over again, it's not about the cylinder. However, the bigger the gap between these two you know, point focus created by the two different curvatures, the more of an impact it's going to have, and of course, the more negative impact it's going to have on vision. Now, this is a bit of a complicated diagram, and I try not to show this one to students too much because I don't want them to get off track with astigmatism, but you'll notice here that this is this represents a lens, and we're talking about kind of lens optics. However, this very well could be the cornea, seeing as how the cornea pretty much is a lens. You'll see here that you get the one focus with a vertical line focus and you get the cylinder focus which is you know the second curvature of the cornea with a horizontal one what is basically showing is that these two images look different and they're oriented different and eventually you know along the line this is kind of like where we call this the interval of strum where it's basically a whole bunch of kind of blurred images and elongate images in a different kind of directions depending how much closer they are to the whether it's the vertical uh, point focus or the horizontal one. Anyways, without getting too confusing about this, what this is basically saying is that the larger the gap between these two, the more opportunity there is to have some weird blur. However, there is one kind of cool concept here, and it's right here in the center, what we call the circle of least confusion, where 
it's the average between the two images and it actually ends up being a pretty stable image. It just so happens that this circle of least confusion also happens to be the spherical equivalent of the refraction. So isn't that interesting how we've been talking about spherical equivalent before and this is another reason why spherical equivalent is so handy because it literally is the midway point between your F1 and your F2 or your cylinder or whatever you want to call it, it all kind of ends up being the same thing. It is the midway point in this toric lens or this toric situation. So there is one more situation that kind of bleeds into this that I hope doesn't send you for a loop because we've talked about how uh, you know, having having different types of astigmatism, whether it's simple myopic, compound myopic, or all the different ones that we've talked about, can have different impacts on vision. And we've also just talked about how cylinder power, the larger it is, the more blurred it will be. And I'm about to show you a situation that basically will make it seem like all this stuff I was talking about could be bunk because here's a situation in mixed astigmatism where at first glance, uh, here we are with a you know, here we are with a hyperopic sphere and a you know relatively large cylinder. We would assume that this vision is probably pretty lousy. However, the reality is, if we were to do the spherical equivalent of this, all right. So let's do it together. Plus 125 plus one half of minus 250 is equal to, and if you're not too bad at your math, you might actually kind of see where this is going already, ends up being, sorry, plus minus 125. The spherical equivalent of this is plano. So here you are with this ugly prescription, well, I mean, ugly prescription. This prescription, it looks significant, but at the end of the day, the spherical equivalent is plano. And what does that mean? It means that this patient doesn't necessarily see as bad as what it may seem in this you know, kind of you know graphical or, or written representation. However, don't forget, we just talked about the larger the gap, the more opportunity there is for blur. However, the spherical equivalent of this, the overall power is, is if we took the average power of what this scenario is, it's actually Plano. Now, does this person see better as a patient whose prescription actually was Plano? Of course not. There's gonna be a lot more kind of going on in this, but if this is gonna teach you anything, it's the representation that definitely not all astigmatism is created equal and you have to start looking at it as a situation uh, not necessarily a refractive error in itself just how does it contribute to either the hyperopia or the myopia and also just like we talked about in this slide just remember the bigger the gap the more potential kind of blur you can get from that overall difference in curvature Okay, this is a good time for a summary. I feel like we went really long on this one and I apologize, it's my fault. I just really want you to understand what astigmatism is all about. And if you found some of this stuff confusing, don't worry, it takes a little bit of time to kind of get your, the grasp of astigmatism. And you, after you see lots of prescriptions and you kind of see a lot of patients, you're gonna to start to kind of understand the concepts I've been giving you. And let's go over some of the concepts that we did talk about today and the ones that you should really be remembering. So remember that astigmatism is due to the toric shape of the cornea or the crystalline lens. 90% of the time it's going to be the cornea. And again, just like I talked about other refractive errors, it doesn't matter. We care more about the overall effect. We don't care that much about where it's coming from. Um, and the result is that you get two different focal points rather than one. Very, very key to remember. Now, astigmatism is a condition that adds to the primary refractive errors of the eye, whether it be my myopia or hyperopia. It is not in itself the condition. It's always accompanied by either myopia or hyperopia. And all astigmatic prescriptions should be considered with a spherical equivalent form to better understand the visual impact. We did it over and over again in this lecture. I hope you get used to doing this simple equation because it tells you so much about the eye. Again, disclaimer or whatever you want it to be, we are not fitting the spherical equivalent. This is not what we're trying to do. However, we are using the spherical equivalent to kind of understand whether the person is kind of overall myopic, overall hyperopic, or even sometimes like we saw in the last example, like they're not actually really that high, uh, myopic or hyperopic, they're actually closer to plano. 
Again, doesn't mean you're not going to correct this person. It just means that you get a good understanding of what their overall kind of experience is, and that helps you make better decisions for them. Uh, and we talked about in the last slide where the larger the cylinder, the more blurred vision will be, um, and therefore you can't ignore the cylinder. We just, you know, we talked about how hyperopia and myopia are the major refractive errors, but you can't discount the fact that the gaps between the two powers or the two meridians of the eye will impact the overall visual experience. And last but not least, mixed astigmatism can yield better visual results than expected. Not necessarily as a rule of thumb because it really depends on the gap between the two meridians. However, remember that, if, like we showed in that example, if you have a little bit of hyperopia and a little bit of myopia and they kind of meet in, in between, there can be the perfect storm where vision is not really that bad. The only reason I showed this is to demonstrate that just because you have a huge cylinder doesn't necessarily mean that vision is really bad. So very important to remember. And that does it for this lecture on astigmatism. Again, I apologize for going so long. I hope that I haven't put you to sleep with this, but remember, if you're gonna be a good optician, you really gotta dig deep into the, this kind of stuff. And again, I hope that you can appreciate the nuances of astigmatism and what it takes to be a good optician. I can't wait to talk to you in the next one. Bye. Hope you enjoyed this week's presentation and don't forget if you have any questions about any of the stuff we cover in these videos make sure to drop a comment down below and I'll make sure to answer and always 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 don't forget to like subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly content. I can't wait to see you in the next one. Bye.